Joining us now is Ojinika Ojiu, with stories trending around the world. Hello, Jinix. Good morning, Dr. Abati. How are you? Friday. TGIF, my favorite day of the week. I, I love I your dance moves. TGIF yeah. dance moves. <laughs> I, we haven't no, gone out the, this whole time. No, this we year, we have to do yes, that. Yes. How are you? I, uh, Rufai, we missed you yesterday. Miss you, I don't grieve for anybody. Are you going to grieve? <laughs> no, okay. Grieve. <laughs> I don't, I don't you don't grieve, no problem. <laughs> 2024, I don't grieve for anybody. Guess what? That's what that's what we're starting the story with no today. Grief. No <laughs> grief. No grief. Well, all right. Viewers, well, no grief. Okay. Well, good morning to you, viewers. Let's begin what's trending this beautiful Friday morning with a catchphrase. No grief for anybody, which was adopted by the youth to usher in the new year. Well, the Nigerian police force early this week warned that the catchphrase, which loosely means do not tolerate any form of nonsense from anybody or do not allow yourself to be bullied by anyone, could plunge Nigeria into crisis of monumental proportions. The spokesperson for the Nigerian police force, Muiwa Adejobi, made the announcement during a press briefing on Tuesday in Abuja. And let me say again, on this note, that the new slogan for 2023-24 for our young ones is no degree for anybody. Uh, we have been informed from our intelligence that this slogan is coming from a revolutionary sector that may likely cause problems across the country. No degree for anybody is being seen as just a normal talk. But in security business, in security community, we have seen it as a very, very dangerous slogan that can trigger crisis. Well, the defense headquarters, on the other hand, has adopted the catchphrase, no grief for anybody, by advising Nigerians not to tolerate terrorists and perpetrators of insecurity. The director of defense and media operations, Edward Buba, made the comment while speaking at a press briefing in Abuja on Thursday as he urged Nigerians to see security as a collective responsibility. This year, 2024, I urge citizens of this country to see security as a collective responsibility of all. Therefore, no greed for terrorists. No greed for perpetrators of insecurity. All right, so Rufai, you had the. I mean, the security forces, there's no synergy here. I mean, the police on one hand is saying, ah, you guys will plunge Nigeria into, you know, <laughs> insecurity. Anarchy. Anarchy. Yes. No grief for anybody. I mean, I don't even know what that means. But you know what? Our governor here, Lagos State Governor, posted a tweet yesterday. Let's pull up that tweet. He, <laughs> he wrote a throwback to this beautiful night of excellence and laughter as we hosted the Super Eagles before they set up for hashtag AFCON 2023. I am looking forward to their first match. And the message to them was clear. No, no grief for, for anybody. anybody. <laughs> Bring home the Cup of Nations. Rufai, go ahead. <laughs> In fact, we should start by sending the police officer, Mr. Yes. Mui, well, good job. Uh, no grief for anybody yes. message. What what are the what is revolutionary <laughs> about no grief for anybody? I mean, I, I I think it has a history that this uh, song uh, that we went viral by a uh, certain gospel singer, yes. you know, and these are slogans. These are chants. These are it's pop culture. Yes, it's pop slang. Absolutely. You know, they've been there from time immemorial. <laughs> I mean, there is no revolutionary slant to anything. The military understands it. It's 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 a word that catches on among the netizens and everything. You know, just like they play. You know, we have a lot of these words. Yes. And even politicians have used it. So is it like a code for criminals when they say no grief for anything? It's nothing of such. And that's why Mr. Fem Falan has been able to ask them. Yeah. What is this thing? I think what the police should be doing is make police no grief for criminals Absolutely. in society. They should go after criminals, bandits, terrorists, terrorizing people in the northeast. Make police no grief for insubordination. A lot of their members of staff have bad welfare. Police officers are suffering. They have nothing to eat. Make police no grief for bad politicians that are sending them to go and do evil, you know, as against the normal ethos they're supposed to sign up for. Make police no grief for bad service. And it goes back to the talk about customer service of the police officers. And that's why I still feel, you know, there should be a service that oriented mindset for the police force not 
you know, a force or authority mindset. Make police no grieve for any katakata, people that cause katakata in society. You know, because they keep saying police is your friend, but it's only when you enter a problem, you know that police might not be your friend. Mm. So police should be concerned about changing that mindset, not about victimizing a common word or, com or people that use the word by saying no grieve for anybody. I'm happy about the military. They, they keyed into the yes. buzzword of no grief for anybody. The governor is using it. Yeah. And I would like to ask, which is, because you know, when they want to bobo us, they say they have intelligence. That's another Gen Z word, bobo. <laughs> no, really. When they want to give us <laughs> a call. Yeah. 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 It's a millennial Okay, it's a millennial word. It's not, it's not okay. Gen Z. Well, okay. So when they want to give us custard, you know. Is that what? They, they, that's Gen another. I mean, I, I'm good with this. Let's speak English. They, 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 Just in case they, we plunge Nigeria into, <laughs> into a no greasy. <laughs> so when, when, when they were they say it's uh, based on intelligence. Yes. They, if there was any intelligence, I thought the military too was supposed to have the intelligence yeah. by not using the word. So Absolutely. I challenged that police PR to bring out the intelligence report <laughs> that say no gree for anybody has become a revolutionary slogan. <laughs> because we live in this same country where people say what's on TV and the police was defending. It was a great grave point you raised, Ayo. We all remember what MC Oluomo said leading up to the election. Mm -hmm. And we all remember what the police officer in Lagos, the commissioner came out to defend. Pretty much was defending him. We all saw people that said worse. They will not go and carry them. Okay. Like, but, right. but you say we well, no agree now. You can young people yes. who decide, you know, I'll just out just of, like you mentioned, uh -huh. pop culture, no grief. And the, the, so many people have put a spin on it. In the Christian world, they say, don't grieve for the devil. Yes, no. They see the DHQ say, don't grieve, no grief for bandits. You know, mm -hmm. we've had, we see governors and always say, no grief for anybody at the at oh, court. Bring, bring back, back, back the court. Yeah, but let me, in defense of maybe perhaps to speak or as to where uh, the, FPRO was coming from. On his Twitter page, he goes on to explain a bit further. He says that, yes, no, he, he, he tempered down a little, I think because of the outcry and the bashing he got from that statement. He said he didn't say that you shouldn't use it, but you should be more uh, reasonable when you want to apply or use the slogan. <laughs> then one of uh, one of his guys, DSP Wright Edafi, PPR in Delta State, <laughs> then sh put um, posted up a, a skit where somebody said no green and then went to, went to hit someone back and then he said, you see what we're talking about? So that's the intelligence report, by the way. Oh, 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 so why are you saying this? How do you say? We all have our parents in the WhatsApp group who would say that you won't go down in Jesus' name. You, won't, you know, things like that. So I can understand his sentiment. But I think he can also see the light-hearted part of this, unlike the people who have shown the DHQ, the governor, spin it around. The police can even turn it around into a slogan for, for the police. So if he's concerned that this might aggravate or push people into perhaps violent um, responses, then let the police in educating the public use it as an opportunity, a tool to spin it around into more positive messaging. Absolutely. So I think rather than just having the, the response by a lot of state actors or officials is to shut down, shut down, shut down, block Twitter, do this, X is gone, is to see how we can use that and spin it into positive news. I love that. Um, Dr. Well, Abati. Very quickly, I find it, uh, you know, shocking that uh, Muiwa Adejobi, the uh, spokesperson of the police, is using the word intelligence. <laughs> that we have gathered intelligence, you know. Wow. So to see a uh, uniformed officer <laughs> using the word intelligence gathering so loosely, so lightly, speaks to the capacity oh. of the uh, institution and the capacity of the spokespersons of these, uh, you know, security institutions. The same Nigerian police that could not gather intelligence when they were slaughtering people oh, in uh, Plateau yes, State, in three different absolutely. local governments, is pursuing intelligence over population. No grief. <laughs> they no grief for anybody. Yeah. So, and then they say, this, this is coming from a revolutionary sector. <laughs> This is a dangerous trend. No, we were the job should not end there. He has to identify that revolutionary sector, where it is located, and share that intelligence with us. So, I mean, I just, I just, they, they, they think this is a joke. <laughs> now, the military did much better, as you have pointed out, saying we no go grieve for terrorists, and he contextualized it by talking about 
collective responsibility in terms of securing Nigeria, which is uh, a moot point that has been made again and again. Now, uh, uh, words are semiotic reference, you know. Uh, language can be interpreted in different ways. And with this, we no good agree. I mean, as a, a student of language, you know, what we have seen is that people have applied it in, in different senses. Yeah. You've given us some examples, the police, the military, then uh, Governor Sonwulu using the same phrase to encourage the uh, super egos to do well in uh, Ivory Coast, even if we have been told that, yes, we have a, 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 a squad, but we don't have a team because these are individual players. But we'll begin to see yes. from uh, Sunday when we play our very first match. But look at another positive sense in which it has been used to show determination, Absolutely. standing up for your rights. I, I read a piece by Mrs. Betty Rabo. She went to uh, a supermarket. When she left the supermarket, she took the, she had enough presence of mind to check the receipt that she had been given, only to find that uh, Philly, uh, no, Salmon, that should not be uh, more than uh, 8,000 Naira. What was recorded on that receipt was 49,000 Naira. She immediately turned Absolutely. back and went back to the supermarket and said, please, check this, uh, check this uh, receipt. How can you sell uh, salmon for 49,000? We used to buy it 8,000 Naira. Even if it's going to jump, why will it jump to 49,000 Naira? And she said, we don't go grill yes. on this matter. Yes. We so don't agree. go grill for this uh, salmon that you have increased. At the end of the day, they asked for a bank account. They refunded her and uh, put the appropriate 8,000 naira there. Yeah. How many of us go to supermarkets, go to restaurants? Yeah. We don't check the receipt. Yeah. They will inflate the money. You just think, oh, this is the amount. You go and pay. I like that kind of Betty Rabot say, we don't go green. Perfect example. It, it, it's, it's about no diligence. Yes. It's about determination <laughs> to defend your rights. Well. So what is Muiwa uh, uh, well. talking about? Uh, freedom is not absolute <laughs> and all that. Their job is to ensure security, yes. safety of lives and property. Yes. That's what you should be talking about <laughs> instead of chasing slogans up and down. <laughs> are they so distracted in 2024 well, that they right. don't know what their assignment is again right. under the, uh, the laws of Nigeria? All right. I will well, well, challenge my very good friend. He must bring that intelligence out. We are waiting, we for, are the waiting for the intelligence. We are. You well, must right. bring it out. <laughs> we are waiting. <laughs> I, don't, I don't agree for you today. All right. Shall we take another story then? <laughs> we are not agreeing. We'll take another story. <laughs> a lawsuit filed by human rights lawyer and activist Maxwell Okbara challenging the 1.5 billion naira allocation to the office of the First Lady of Nigeria, Senator Oluremi Tinubu, in the 2023 Supplementary Appropriation Act, which was recently signed into law, suffered a setback on Thursday. The recent appointment of a judge for the case to the Court of Appeal created a vacuum and as such affected the hearing of the case, which was set for January 11th. Maxwell Okbara is contending that the 1.5 billion naira allocation violates constitutional provisions as the office of the First Lady is not recognized in the 1999 constitution. The lawyer seeks an injunction for the court to declare the allocation as unlawful. The essence of this case is to ensure that you don't waste a uh, public fund. You don't waste because the people that are supposed to benefit from um, uh, uh, allocation and fiscal uh, from a uh, federation account are being listed in the in the constitution. Office of the First Lady is not there. So now the president has said, I'm going to cost cost. That's why we are asking the woman to return that 1.5 billion naira to the federal government so that it can be used for some other things, not to maintain office, not to maintain cars. And as a pastor, I thought that, and as a mother, I thought that he would have said, no, the money you are giving me to maintain office of the first lady, I don't need it. It's, a, it's wasteful. But he still uh, collect it. And we have believe that he has not spent that money. Because if he spent that money and the court order that he should return it, he would definitely return it. That's their opposition. <laughs> Let's see if that would happen, Maxwell. Well, you know, in the meantime, <laughs> I can't even hold, catch my no breath. Grief, Max, no grief, no grief, no grief. Maxwell has just really put hit the nail on the head there. He's actually doing the Lord's work at yeah. this point. I mean, I think he made a lot of valid points. One, which is, you know, she's a pastor. And the fact that the um, allocation and the office of the First Lady no, is not recognized in the Constitution, it is, you know, it's absolutely wasteful for that to be appropriated to the office of the Lord. Let's see if uh, the, the First Lady will return the funds. Well, in the meantime... 
Peter Obi, the presidential candidate of the Labour Party in the 2023 election, has criticized the directive by the president to slash the number of people on entourages for international and local travels by 60 percent. Presidential spokesperson Ajurin Gelali announced the new measure on Tuesday, stating that the move is part of cost-cutting measures of the presidency and that the measure will affect the office of the president, vice president, first lady, ministers and heads of agencies. While reacting to the development, Peter Obi in a post on X said the measure is just scratching the surface. His tweet reads in part. The just announced 60% cut in the size of federal official entourages on travel is one positive step towards a reduction of cost of governance and a way of halting wastage. But this measure is just scratching the surface as it is limited in scope and can only lead to a very negligible savings. We are yet to be told how much savings this will amount to. While this modest step may be somewhat commendable, what is desirable should be both a 60% reduction in federal official overseas trips as well as a 60% reduction in the size of delegations. Most importantly, what our current economic reality demands a 60% reduction in the total cost of governance at the federal level. It is not enough to announce arbitrary cuts in the size of federal official entourages. The nation needs to be informed of how much the measure will save and where such savings will be applied. We're talking about savings here. I mean, both Maxwell and Peter Obi have, you know, said the right uh, things here because, I mean, what is the cut? What is the cut of governance here? What is the 60%? What does the 60% entail? That's what a lot of people are asking. Yeah, to be fair, a number of people have said that it, it yeah. might be negligible yeah. in terms of the cost of, when you look at the cost of governance or how much savings is 60% cut in the staff members or members of staff who travel. But that's not the big thing. Yeah. That there should be more um, of, a, of a deeper look into other areas which we talked about in terms of minist ministries, department agencies. We looked at, um, we've talked about going back to the Steve Orensire report in terms of you know, streamlining government and cutting government um, wastages, especially with duplication of, um, of, of activities or responsibilities. We've talked about that a number of times. So while this sounds really nice and the optics look good and any savings, to be fair, mm -hmm. is welcome, Absolutely. what we're saying is that there's a lot more that can be done. Now, going back to the story of Maxwell Opara and the First Lady, mm -hmm. I, um, what I was going to say was that, so two things, it boggles my mind why you know, successive governments can't just put it into, if, they, if you're really passionate about First Lady, you know, the Office of, of the First Lady, make it as part of the law and let things be done legally. If, it's so, if you're so passionate, the U.S. has the Office of the First Lady, there's budget allocated to that office. So if you really are passionate about your wife being, but let's stop this narrative of, oh, it's not in the Constitution, it will not be recognized, and then you keep putting money into that and it's illegal, it's not constitutionally recognized. Why, why do we keep doing that? The second aspect on the flip side is this. The president's wife famously said during campaigns that she doesn't need Nigeria's money, that they have enough money of their own. So in terms of running her office, can she take the same energy into ensuring that it's 1.5 billion naira? It's not a lot if you look at it for, uh, you know, in terms of how much money they have, and they, I'm sure they probably declared. So it's not anything that should be contentious to this extent where Nigerians are calling for a return of the funds. In terms of being honorable, just do it and, and, and spend, you know, money for yourselves. I believe that there should be an office created if we want it, but it should be done properly. Right. Let it go through the House of Representatives, let it go, let it be passed as law and be signed in, and let us know we have an office. And let this, you know, under, under, under um, budget um, you know, allocations be done. Absolutely. That's my take on that. that they, do, they, they do do work. Since, the, um, um, since um, First Lady Miriam Babangida, she, has, she uplifted the office of the First Lady, and they play quite a critical role. But it's important that it's well-defined in our Constitution, and then there's also an allocation that's reasonable yeah. in light of um, current economic um, realities. Do you think realities. Maxwell Okpara will go anywhere with this case? I mean, I'm not even sure, Dr. Abati. No, Nigeria does not need uh, first to lady. put an uh, office of first lady or to define it in the constitution. No. It is unknown to the law. Yeah. It is unknown to the law. And they don't do that even in other countries of the world. I think it was Mrs. Obama that was interviewed in, you know, in one of these uh, episodes. And she was saying that even in the White House, there's a limit to what you can eat. Yes. If you eat more than what you, you should eat, you, you will pay, pay for it. it. Yeah. She said it's like living in a hotel, so there's nothing about wives here. 
you know, people, the Nigerian people voted for the president. It's the president that is known to them. Yeah. There's nothing called office of the first lady yeah. or office of the wife of the governor. However, the important thing by this uh, suit by Maxwell of Para, which everybody must note, is that the law is there to serve the people, but you never really know the full extent of the law or the extent to which government breaks the law unless you test the law. So what Maxwell Opara is doing is he's called testing the law. Mm -hmm. And he has quoted the relevant sections, sections 80, 81, 84, and section 162, dealing with federal allocations. And nowhere in all of these sections, he is saying, is the office of the uh, first lady mm -hmm. mentioned, either at the federal level or at the state level. These positions are unknown to law. It's a convention that we borrowed from the Americans, whereby we elevate the wife of, uh, of the president or the governor to a height that uh, is not uh, provided for in the law. Uh, we all laughed when uh, uh, President uh, Buhari, I think in Germany, when he was asked about the wife, and he said uh, the place of his wife is in the other room. Now we laughed at it. Some we, people we, laughed. Some we, people we, did not find we, it funny. We thought it was misogynistic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some people thought. Yes. But it was stating a basic fact. Which is, you know, he may have used the phrase the other room, which mm. people may find offensive. Yeah, so but the import of it is that that office does not exist in the governance process. Wives exist to support their husbands, whether in the kitchen or in the living room. Uh, don't let me bring up that conversation. Now, the other thing you pointed out is that the judge, uh, who was in charge of the case, Justice Muhammad, has now been elevated to the uh, appellate, appellate court, yes. and that uh, the case was supposed to be uh, had yesterday in court, yeah. uh, January 11. That's not an issue. The uh, Federal High Court has a system. They have 94 judges it's under the Federal, Federal High Court system yes. in 38 divisions right. in 36 states, including the Federal Capital Territory. And the head of that, uh, the chief judge, of the Federal High Court of Nigeria is uh, uh, Justice uh, John Soho. Mm. It is Justice on John Soho's uh, responsibility to reassign the case. Yeah. That's his job. There's a head of the uh, Federal High Court, okay? After all, recently he redeployed uh, judges. So the, nobody should have any fear in that regard. Nobody should say, oh, they don't want to hear the case. That is not true. Mm -hmm. the, the, the court, part of the job of the court is to allow citizens to test the law. As for the point made by uh, Mr. Peter B about uh, uh, cosmetic uh, attempt at cutting mm. costs, no, it's absolutely correct. This is what we've been saying mm. since the president announced uh, a, a slashing of entourage mm. and a delegation list. We've said it. It is for government to plug leakages. Mm. And Peter B drew attention to the uh, 2024 budget and said, look, if you look at that 2024 budget, there is a lot of uh, opportunity for wastage there. We want a leaner government. We don't want a fat government where people will go into a government and they develop, a, they develop a pot bellies. That's not the kind of government we want. We want a lean and efficient government. Right. Uh, so he's right in that regard. And there are other things that the president can do, including looking and going back to the Onosaye report. Absolutely. We'll fight really quickly on uh, Peter Obi's case <laughs> on uh, cutting costs of go governance. No, really but, I mean, before. but he said it all yes. because there were many points for wastage in that yes. budget. I mean, when you even see what's happening in the humanitarian ministry, you wonder what is going on. And that's why I feel that ministry should be scrapped. You can yeah. have intervention in this program without having a ministry. Obasanjo did poverty alleviation program. There was no humanitarian ministry. I don't know why President Buhari created it. It should be scrapped. We should reduce bureaucracy. Just as we should never even think of the office of a first lady. As you are there as a woman with your man, you support your man. There are many intellectual first ladies I've appreciated so much. Hillary Clinton was one of them when she was, you know, wife of Bill Clinton. Did a lot of support as regards policy, you know, because she's a very cerebral uh, Ivy League school trained woman. You know, they both live in an Ivy League institution. And he did a lot of work with him, you know, as regards the educational sector and many sector. Uh, Joe Biden's wife, too, is doing the same. You know, equally, uh, Emmanuel Macron's teacher is currently teaching him, too, about policy and but conduct his wife. They're not really teaching each other anymore. You guess I know. So uh, while she was there, she, I mean, she, she, she did a lot of that 
Also, I mean, we've had very strong characters, you know, that are women in the life of leaders and they put in, but we cannot give room for bureaucracy. Yeah. And we keep going back to citing Miriam Babangida because, yeah, she did it during a military escrime in gym and she went away with it. It does not make it good. Uh, you know, you can have your own pet project, fund it yourself. Uh, uh, Mrs. Tinobu has a new era foundation or renewed initiative. initiative. She should fund it from their own personal purse yeah. and everything. Use their get will, goodwill to get money to fund it. You should not try as much as possible to use that to now open an office and bring more. But bureaucracy. you know, I get Ayo's point, really. Uh. I do because if there is an office for the first lady, then these allocations can be justified instead of having those budget in the I, appropriation uh, act. Just give her an you, office. When when she means an office, like in the United States, the office is really not for the first lady. Yeah. It is just, you know, because she hosts events and all of that. We're so they, limbo. yes, she has a limb, but they we're allocate limbo. cards just in case Ayo becomes a first lady. <laughs> we need to make sure <laughs> that okay. Ayo has a good. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. No, it's not a joke, but it is the truth. It is the fair. This is the fair fact. It needs to be. Yeah. Yes. We're realistic. Would you respect? We can. Equally, uh, uh, start having elections for the office of the first lady too. Well, you know, and conducted by INEC. Yeah. You know, if if that's the case, we should not open room for any bureaucracy of some sort. Right. Two shall become one. The Bible says, "Ayo, you quote Bible a lot." So the president and his wife are one. Okay. There's no extra office for no, the No person. extra office for the she first cannot. lady. Well, let's see. Maxwell is advocating that if she, if they win the case, I hope that Senator Uluremi Tinubu will return the funds. Shall we take another story in Accra, Ghana? Please, let's be serious. In Accra, Ghana, where the government canceled a pan-African event, which was scheduled to take place on the 7th of January. At the Independence Square, the event was approved by the government in November 2023. All special guests, including the presidential candidate of the Labour Party in 2023, Peter Obi, Professor Lumumba from Kenya, Dr. Ari Kana from Zimbabwe, and a host of others scheduled to speak at the convention tagged Igniting the Voices of Africa had arrived at the location for the event where thousands of people had gathered from all over Ghana and around the globe when the organizers of the event were informed of the cancellation just hours before the event's commencement, eliciting outrage. Peter, I'll be on a flyer. I will spend the last penny to be here. I stand here as the General Secretary of the over 12.5 million Ghanaian students of this country. To my knowledge, almost all student leaders in this country were invited to this convention. Why? They know this is a convention that will ignite their voices of Africa. They know this is a convention that we would have to listen to the other improvements of other countries. I got here and I'm told that powers from above have stopped their program. I'm sad. We might not be at the convention, but that will not stop the conversation. It is in this Accra, Ghana, that the Osage for Kwame Nkrumah spoke to the world that the independence of Ghana meant nothing if the continent of Africa was not free. We may not be at the convention center, but we intend to continue to preach the gospel of truth until we reach the promised land. Well, this was an unfortunate event. Um, last week, the people of the young people of Ghana trooped out in mass in protest against this event that was supposed to, you know, speak to the youth, ignite Africa. They had like amazing speakers here, but you know, obviously, like you heard Peter Obi and the rest of the speakers there say that you know it's not the end of the event. They're going to move it to another place. But I mean, the government came out with some ridiculous reasons, saying that unforeseen circumstance caused the cancellation. Dr. Abati, really well, quickly. Isn't this how, you know, African leaders and African governments uh, yes. behave generally? Uh, the, this was Constitution Day on Sunday. Yes. And earlier in the day, the same president of uh, uh, Ghana, Kufu Adu, in a, in a statement, had said his government was committed to the freedom of assembly and association, which is Article 21 sub 1 of the Ghana Constitution. Article 21 of Ghana Constitution recognizes the freedom of uh, assembly. And yet, the same day, yeah. the same government, an approval for an event that it has given on November 11, yeah. 2023, decided to cancel just two hours 
to the beginning of the event. And what is the excuse? The Diaspora Affairs Department of the government of Ghana, which appears to be a very confused the department of uh, the government of Ghana, has come up with two different kinds of statements. First, it says it's not, uh, it wasn't canceling the convention, that it was canceling the Red Line Festival. So, which is the convention? which is the Red Line Festival. In another explanation, this same Department of Diaspora Affairs says that there was tension at the venue, at the Black Star Square, between the organizers and the military. Mm -hmm. Hence, they had, had to cancel, and they asked the organizers to come and collect their 10,000 Ghanaian CDs, which they had collected since uh, November. That's how, you know, African governments, uh, you know, uh, behave. They talk about commitment uh, to the Constitution, but they, at the same time, what has been violated in that event on Sunday, January 7th in uh, Ghana is the right of the people to the freedom of assembly and association. Mm -hmm. And beyond that is a blot on Ghana. Right. Mm -hmm. Because this was meant to be an international event, and truly it was, with persons from Zimbabwe, from uh, South Africa, from Nigeria, from other parts of the world. And yet the government of Ghana did not see the connection with the image of the country. Right. Mm. I think it was a, a case of the president himself eating his own words mm. about his commitment to the Ghanaian constitution mm -hmm. and the provision of Article 21. All right. The true case of what happened was a subtext of dirty politics. Bedi was on this seat you sat down right. a couple of months ago. Finally, there's been a poster going around in Ghana as regards a marked face. Finally, the Marx face has been unveiled, and Bedia Kaur, the real estate mogul, wants to run for presidency. Right. He was the one that called all those people for this conference. He's tried to put a slant of Pan-Africanism and bringing people together, but it's also around this presidential campaign and initiative. Right, exactly. So this was what really happened, and that's why the government did this, which is wrong, Very because wrong. you shouldn't stifle opposition. So the subtext is politics. Absolutely. Really unfortunate incident in Ghana. Africans need to unite, as always. Well, let's end what's trending today by kicking off your weekend with the sensational hit single, Holy Ghost, by singer-songwriter Omar Lay. The singer released the official video of the song, which has stopped the charts in 31 countries on Apple Music. <laughs> Amazing Omale, he just released that last month. Already 78 million amazing. streams, completely amazing. I mean, he's not green for anybody. Omale, no green for anybody. I mean, let, I hope that that song, Holy Ghost Fire, will ignite your confidence so you don't green for anybody yes. this year. <laughs> well, I'd like to uh, thank you all for your great analysis as always on What's Trending. Well, all right, that's all I have for you on What's Trending today. I'll see you all next week.